Welcome to the class. Uh, first, I would like to send you the warmest greetings from cold Finland. Hope that uh, there in Taiwan the weather is different. We have a lot of snow here and the temperature is minus 30. Uh, we all are very enjoying such kind of things. My name is Nikolai Veresov and I am from Finland. Uh, first of all, I would like to send my words of gratitude to uh, Gabriel who just gave me the opportunity to make this class for you. And uh, you have some materials in front of you. My questions should be distributed and you have also PowerPoint presentation you can easily follow. So don't be sad if you cannot see clearly things from the wall. You have the same papers in front of you. Well, at least I hope you have. So, and the topic for our class is uh, reading Vygotsky's uh, thinking and speech. And I would like to start this uh, uh, discussion or lecture with some introductory words. Hope you also have them uh, in front of you, but if not, so uh, I think uh, you can uh, follow what I'm going to tell. Well, when we think and when we speak about this famous book of Vygotsky, which is called Thinking and Speech. Uh, we have to have in mind some things uh, that uh, this book is probably uh, the most known and less understood book written by Vygotsky. There are some deep reasons which make it difficult to understand, even now, when we have a lot of data, a lot of experiments have been done in this area, I mean the area of thinking and speech. This book which was written uh, over 80 years ago, still contains a great number of ideas which are still very promising, uh, very fresh, and even inspiring. And uh, before coming to the topic, I would like to say that, that, that the aim of my lecture is to prepare you for the reading of this book from this perspective from the point of view of the ideas and principles it contains. So, I can put it in another way. Uh, before you will read this book yourself, I would like you to help to read this book having in mind some theoretical and methodological frameworks which might help you to find a kind of orientation inside this uh, terra incognita. This book, Thinking and Speech, is a kind of unknown country, unknown land for you. And to find the orientation in, in this land, you need at least to have a map or navigator in your car. So, I would like to help you to escape the superficial reading, uh, which uh, very often brings knowledge, but doesn't bring understanding. So, I will give you the theoretical and methodological contexts and you will find them in the content. Not to be lost in this huge uh, book. And before this class, uh, I try to formulate some questions to the audience. But anyway, my first question is that I can formulate it in a very clear way. So, question number one, what is or what are the main topics discussed in preface and chapter one of the book? Could you be so kind to formulate those ideas and make a sort of uh, list of three or four key words ex expressing these topics and the subject matter of the book? I will give you some time to, to do this, so we can interrupt for five minutes, and after then we will continue, because after that I will propose my list of topics and uh, things and ideas. So, the first interruption comes here.
And I, well, I hope that now uh, you had enough time to formulate your, your uh, lists of the main topics discussed in the preface and the chapter one of the book. But what I'm going to do is just to show my list. So, uh, as for me, I can put it in this way. So, for me, there are three ideas which are discussed uh, in preface of the book and in, a, uh, in the first chapter. The first, of course, is the idea of the unity of thinking and speech. Not about thinking and speech separately, but the idea about the unity of thinking and speech. So, in other words, it's a point about the psychological systems. So one of the psychological systems is the idea of the unity of thinking and speech, which combine one system. The second point, which is the core point here in the preface of the book and in the first chapter, is of course the idea of development. So development takes the second position. And the, la and the last point I would like to stress is the uh, discussion about the methods of analysis of the psychological systems. How we can approach to these systems theoretically and experimentally. So, from my point of view, there are these three ideas which are uh, the basic ideas uh, uh, of uh, the book preface and chapter one. And to make sure that my list does make any sense. So, mm, uh, we can try in the text some specifications about. So, if you look on the uh, number one in my list, psychological system, unity of thinking and speech. If you look on the preface, page 39, you will see that it is written here, that this book deals with one of the most complex and difficult problems of experimental psychology, the problem of thinking and speech. So, uh, then we come to development. Look, the same page of preface, Vygotsky writes, first we must analyze the empirical data which have been accumulated and attempt to assess their more general implications through an analysis of available information of phylogenesis and ontogenesis, we must attempt to identify the most useful point of departure for the resolution of the problem. You see, phylogenesis and ontogenesis are the key words here. And the last point about the methods of analysis of the developing units or psychological systems. So, again, look uh, uh, on the preface. You will see, Vygotsky writes, to our knowledge, there has as yet been no systematic attempt to address this problem experimentally. So, and the target of the book is just to find the, 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 the way how to uh, address the problem experimentally and theoretically. And of course, we can, you can very easily find the other places which can prove that what I selected as the main topics really are, uh, are well, in the preface and, the, and the, uh, chapter one. So now it's time to formulate my second question. So hopefully you had these questions before, uh, but uh, I really would like uh, to uh, say, to put this question like this. What do you think? Whether the cultural historical theory was already created before Vygotsky undertook th this study of thinking and speech? So. When Vygotsky started to write this book, does it mean that he already had cultural historical theory or not? If not, what place thinking and speech takes in creation of cultural historical theory? If yes, in, on what degree cultural historical theory of high mental functions the theory of Vygotsky reflects itself in this book, Thinking and Speech. Or in what degree the book reflects the main tenets of cultural historical theory. Of course, this is the, this is, this is the question which is not easy, but please take time and express your opinion and uh, 
maybe Gabriel will help you to formulate it more clear in a more clear way. So we have another break for five minutes for your open discussion. So now after the break during which you really presented your opinions about that, which I really hope. I would like to tell what I think about that. From my point of view, well, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading a little. So from my point of view, this book reflects the cultural historical theory which was created in the late 1920s. From this it comes that in order to understand Vygotsky's approach to the problem of thinking and speech and their development, we have to have some basic knowledge of Vygotsky's theoretical approach. If not coming to this book with this basic knowledge, the understanding of the content of this book will be very limited or even wrong. This is exactly right in many respects. This is right because the cultural historical theory was and still is, still remains, very different from the theories which dominated, are still dominating in the world psychology. And this is quite hard task, not to understand the theory from the book, but to understand the book from the theory. Yet the task is even more difficult. By this I mean one circumstance which should be taken into account when you begin to read this book of Vygotsky. I mean the time and the evolution. Let me explain. The mystique of Vygotsky is that he was working in the field of academic psychology during a very short time, actually around 10, 11 years, from 1924 to 1934. If we compare him with his famous peer, Maybe you know this peer, the psychology which was born the same year as Vygotsky. Of course, I mean Jean Piaget. We will see that this time was really very short. But the mystic is that Vygotsky f left a big, a great amount of texts, papers, articles, unpublished manuscripts, diaries, notes, and many, many, many other things, most of them remain unpublished even now. Even more, during those ten years he made significant evolution in his theoretical views. He developed his approach to psychology very rapidly from poor reflexology at the beginning to the cultural historical approach at the end. This means that different texts articles, books of Vygotsky, written in different times, were very different from the theoretical point of view. Not all of books of Vygotsky and articles of him, not all of them belong to cultural historical theory. They really reflect different periods and different theoretical positions and therefore they might look controversial, but they are not controversial if we understand this evolution, this change of approaches. And if we look on thinking and speech, we will see that the situation is even much more difficult. And the difficulty is that he started to write his book, this book, having one theoretical position and finish this book having different theoretical position. This book is somehow in the middle of the transitional from one approach to another. And we have evidence in the text which really shows uh, this situation. If you look on preface, page 4, what is written here? Look, this book, 
is the product of nearly 10 years work. Many of questions that emerged in the investigation were not apparent up to when we began. We were forced to reconsider our positions during the investigation. Consequently, the results of the great deal of hard work had to be discarded. You see, Vygotsky is saying about reconsideration of the positions during the investigation. But what is this reconsidering of the positions? In brief, during the study, Vygotsky and his research group made a transition from the position of distinction between lower functions and higher functions, lower mental functions and higher mental functions, which is the basic of cultural historical theory. And he moved to the position to the position of the relations of higher and mental, uh, higher and, and lower functions into one psychological system. And this position can be identified as a systemic and sense-based construction of human consciousness. And in this book we can see very clearly this evolution of Vygotsky's approach. On the other hand, of course, this transition makes this book very difficult to understand. To make it easier to understand, the only way is to have clear picture of these two theoretical positions before reading the thinking and speech. If you know before reading of the book, these two theoretical positions, the starting point and the finish. You then will be able to see the deep logic of the, of the book. And this will help you to find a sort of orientation in, inside the book. And this point, these difficulties which I just described, they really dictate, they create this uh, kind of uh, requirements for my classes. So, the structure of my class, of our class, will f follow from those things I just discussed. First, we will discuss the item, what is higher mental function? What is lower mental function? And their development. Because this point is the core for cultural historical psychology. This will be the first item for discussion. Then, we will see how his approach to higher mental functions has been changed and transformed into the idea of the psychological systems. I will show you this transition. And then, number three, the last item for discussion will be the question of the unit of analysis which is the main theoretical uh, point discussed in chapter one of Thinking and Speech, and which, of course, underlines the whole book. So, the list of questions I'm going to discuss looks like the following. First, high mental functions and their development, framework of cultural historical psychology and general genetic law of development. Point two, psychological systems and the idea of systemic and sense-based construction of human consciousness. And the last problem is the problem of theoretical and experimental analysis of human consciousness. The problem of analysis by units, but not by elements. So these will be three topics I'm going to discuss during this class. And now we come to topic number one. Okay, so now uh, the first item is on the screen. Look here. Uh, I'm going to discuss the idea of high mental functions and their development. 
as a framework of cultural historical psychology. And we will also discuss the general genetic law of cultural development, which is uh, uh, the, really the general law on which the uh, cultural historical theory is based. And uh, I would like to begin with uh, the statement which really need to be clarified. Very often the researchers identify Vygotsky's theory as non-classical psychology, non-classical psychology. And it's, sometimes it sounds very strange because if something is non-classical psychology, it should be then something which can be called as classical psychology. And what really makes Vygotsky's approach non-classical or even better to put it neoclassical psychology? If we look on the subject matter, higher mental functions of human being, like logical memory, thinking, imagination, and things like that, we can see that higher mental functions are very classical because from the times of Wilhelm Wundt, they were in the focus of the psychological approach. High mental functions are very classical. But what makes Vygotsky's approach non-classical? I think this is quite interesting and important question. And what I'm going now to, to show you the picture of this classical approach and non-classical approach to make it clear. So you can see on, on, the, on this slide, or you can see your papers. I'm nearly sure that this uh, PowerPoint is in front of you. And what really this picture shows? It shows the distinction between lower mental functions and higher mental functions and the development. So, there are lower mental functions which are equal of human beings and animals. Animals also have senses, representations, sensations, memory, attention, things like that. So, on the other side, there are higher mental functions which are, by definition, exclusively human. For example, logical memory is exclusively human or verbal thinking is also human. That's why classical psychology calls it higher mental functions. And if you look on the history of psychology taking last 150 years, you will see that the idea of development from lower mental functions to high mental functions is focused on one interesting point that there is a development from lower to higher and there are two groups of factors which are influencing on this development. The first group of factors we can call as social factors like education, family, social relations, cultural patterns, rituals, habits, and things like that. The second group of factors are biological factors, genetical, physiological, brain activity, neuro, neurons, and so on and so forth. 
So, these two groups of factors are influencing the development. But look, what is interesting here? If you look on the history of psychology, you will see that there were, there were theoretical approaches, the schools in psychology, which were saying that social factors are primary factors, are supreme factors, and biological factors are secondary. So, those theories which emphasize the, 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 the leading role of social factors can be called social, socio-genetical theories. They do not neglect biological factors. They just say that social factors are more important factors than the biological ones. On the other hand, there are a lot of psychological theories and approaches in schools which, on the, on the other hand, are saying that biological factors are the leading ones and social are the secondary. And we can call those theories biogenetical or biogenetical theories. And the whole history of psychology, from the times of Wilhelm Wundt up to now, can be seen as a sort of the history of debates between these two approaches, between these two camps of psychologists. They are discussing these things from the point of view of which group of factors is dominating, is more important and which group is less important. And this is the classical psychology. And this psychology is also impacted to pedagogy and education. You see that there are some teachers who say that well, the family and education and cultural patterns are the most important. And there are a lot of teachers who say that, well, we can do nothing because if the child is, is, is genetically damaged or bad or something like that from bad, bad family and, and, and so on and so forth. So, and this is very uh, uh, popular and you will find a lot of discussions in the newspapers and magazines and journals about that. And this picture is the classical picture. Nobody puts this picture on the doubt. So the only point is, the only discussion is which factors are leading. And what Vygotsky proposed is that he just said that this understanding of the development of lower mental functions and high mental functions and, and, and factors is totally wrong. And it should be replaced by the other, by, by different approach which can open a new perspective of understanding of the problem of development of higher mental functions. And that was the kind of revolution Vygotsky proposed to psychology. And that's why we can call his theory a kind of non-classical, non-classical psychology. And now I'm going to show you the picture Vygotsky proposed to this. And the picture looks like this. You see, Vygotsky's approach is that there is no concrete relations from lower mental functions to high mental functions. It never happens so that high mental functions are developed lower mental functions. It means that we can develop lower mental functions the whole life and we will never get the higher mental functions instead of them. They are not replacing each other. They coexist in, the, in, a, in, a, in our mind. And our mind is a sort of combination of lower functions and mental functions. And the relations between them are much more complex than classical psychology thinks about because lower mental functions have their own source and origin and physiology is their origin 
our biology is the origin of lower mental functions. But if you look on higher mental functions, higher mental functions are coming not from biology, are not from lower mental functions. High mental functions are coming from the social relations, from the social world. So, the social relations, the social surrounding, the social environment is the source of development, not the factor of development, but the source of development. That was the idea Vygotsky proposed to the world psychology and he tried to develop. But what happened? For many, many years, this approach was understood as one of the social genetical approaches. Even now you can find a lot of uh, articles which say that Vygotsky was the psychologist who said that social factors are the most important. But look, this is the kind of misunderstanding beca because Vygotsky never said about social factors. For him, the social was not the factor. For him, the social was the source of development, the origin of mind, but not the factor which influences. And this is very important. And this kind of misunderstanding still exists and comes from generation to generation of psychologists, which really brings a sort of very deep misunderstanding of the approach. And I would like you to have this in mind before you go and read Thinking and Speech and other books. But what about the factors then? Does it mean that Vygotsky neglected social factors and biological factors? Of course not. He didn't neglect the factors. To understand his approach, I will give you an example. I think that this example will really make the picture clear. Okay, imagine you have a car. You have a nice looking car like Lexus or something. And you are enjoying your driving. But to drive the car, you have two pedals, the brake and the gas. If you want the car to move uh, quick, you just press the gas pedal. If you want your car to slow down, you just press the, the brake pedal. So, you are just operating with these pedals just to regulate the speed of, the, of, of your car movement, right? So, what are you doing? What you are doing with the pedals? You are speeding up the car, you are slowing down the car, But if somebody will come to you and say that the reason why the car is moving is the, is the pedals, he will be absolutely wrong. Because everybody knows that the source, the reason why the car is moving is not the pedals, is the engine which is in the car. So engine is the source which makes the car possible to move. But pedals are just regulators. The car is moving not because of the pedals, the car is moving because of the motor, because of the engine. So, Vygotsky says that social world is the source, is the engine of development. But factors can speed up development or they can slow down the development, they can even block the development, they can influence the development, but they never define the development itself, because development does not depend on factors. Because development has its own, let's say, engine, motor. <laughs> and there is a difference between the motor and the pedals. So this is the core point of Vygotsky's proposition to the world psychology that really changed the whole picture. So factors are important, but they are only factors. What is 
the most important is the, the, the motor, the engine, the source. And social relations, according to Vygotsky, are not the factors but the sources of development. So I think that after that, that example of, of the car, you, will, you now is able to understand the, the message. So, and this is the idea of how to analyze higher mental functions. Vygotsky says that higher mental functions are the functions of, of the mind, are the uh, processes in the mind, and we can analyze, we can study, we can make a research about the development of higher mental functions if we understand the real source, the real place from which they are coming to our mind. But there is a big problem here. The problem is that the only way, the only one way to make a study about high mental functions is not to analyze them when they are already developed, when they are already fruits. The only way to study, to analyze, to understand the nature of these uh, fruits is to restore the whole process of their development from the source, from the roots to fruits. I will give you one more example. Because Apple is quite a good example here. So if you look on the apple, of course you can describe the apple or banana or whatsoever. Just apple is something which is round, well, sometimes tasty, sometimes, well, sweet. It can be, it can be uh, red, green or, or just yellow. So, and... Doing this, you are just describing, you are just describing empirically what this, uh, uh, how and uh, uh, how this apple looks like. But even if you will give a most exact and detailed explanations, you will never understand what really the apple is. To understand what apple is means you have to understand how it appears. You have to understand that it should be a tree it should be roots, it should be flowers, and then buds, and then the fruits. If you are able to reconstruct in your mind, in experiments, in theory, the whole process which brings this apple to life, then you will say to yourself, okay, now I understand what it really is. And this is very important. This is the second point which makes uh, uh, Vygotsky's approach a non-classical approach because he was the first psychologist in the world who put the point very clearly saying that if you want to understand high mental functions you should restore the whole process of its development in phylogenesis genesis and ontogenesis. So the subject matter of Vygotsky's theory is not high mental functions. The subject matter is the process of development of higher mental functions. Vygotsky was the first psychologist who said that we are not interested in studying developed forms. We have to study the very process of development from the beginning up to the end. Because we have to understand why the apple looks like this. And here is the next slide which shows what I just told. Oops. 
something like this. Okay, you have the same. To, to understand the mental function means to restore both theoretically and experimentally the whole process of its development in philo and ontogenesis. And one more quotation. I'm not going to read the whole sentence. But Vygotsky says that traditional view, traditional psychology neglects the process of development. And neglecting development bring, brings the result that the uh, uh, nature of high mental functions remained unexplained and misunderstood. So, I would like to stress this again, that in cultural historical theory, the subject matter is not high mental functions, but the process of development of high mental functions. What are the roots of the tree and what are the branches of the tree, the leaves and flowers, the buds then finally bring the apples. This is quite clear right now, but in the beginning of 20s of last year, it was not clear for many, many researchers. And Vygotsky was the pioneer in establishing the developmental approach to analysis of uh, human consciousness and human mind. This makes him interesting even now. But why he selected such a difficult way? What was the reason for that? Why not just to study an apple? Why not just to take an apple and make an analysis uh, with the chemical or biological instruments, just to cut it into the pieces and taste it and so on? Why not? Because high mental function is not <laughs> an apple, by the way. So, the point here, why Vygotsky took this perspective, this, that, that perspective, was very, very interesting. And I would like to put the other slide and you will see. What was discovered during the studies of high mental functions? Vygotsky discovered very, very interesting and intriguing and crucial point. The, the high mental functions which are already developed, the matured high mental functions, or flowers of development, or fruits of development, are closed for direct observation. And this really requires the different approach. So the functions which are developed, they become in ground. So when they move within extremely complex transformation of all of the function structure takes place, and their entire construction becomes uh, 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 closed for the analysis. So you see that the difference between the mental functions and the apple is that the apple is the result. You can see the result. You can absorb the apple. You can take the apple. You can analyze the apple. But when we are dealing with high mental functions, because of internalization, they go inside the human mind. They live inside the mind. And you cannot absorb them directly, as you can absorb the apple, for example. If we take thinking, sometimes we think nobody can see the process of thinking. The process of thinking if it happens, it happens very often inside. So, and 
it's easy to analyze the apple, but to analyze thinking, you have to find the other way. That's why Vygotsky selected this way, very difficult way to find the instruments, to find the theoretical and experimental instruments to be able to reconstruct, to restore the whole process of development from very beginning up to the very end. And this is the only way how to make it uh, not absorbable, but how to make it uh, possible to study. So, it means that there are at least two reasons which really moved Vygotsky to the idea of the, that development of higher mental functions should be the subject matter. The first reason is that social, social is not a factor but the source. And the second idea is that when the function is developed, so it goes inside and it, it is now closed for any direct observation and, and, and analysis. These two things made uh, uh, put such kind of requirements and uh, the result, the, the answer to these requirements was what Vygotsky was saying that the, the theory of the theory of uh, cultural historical theory is the theory of development of high mental functions and I put it now like this for you to to make it clear Okay? Is it okay? Oh no. Like this? So, the subject matter of cultural historical theory is about high mental functions. But the subject matter is the process of development of high mental functions. If we want to understand what they are, we have to understand how they were developed because their construction is the result of their development. And now you see there are two English words, the structure and the construction. The structure is the components of the system. The construction is the uh, uh, result of the development when the new structures are interacting with the old structures and old structures are included in, in the new structures and so on and so forth. So, Vygotsky was not speaking about the structure of high mental functions but the, about the construction of high mental function which is very different. And I find it very important because very often in translations of Vygotsky's texts into English, the word construct, construction was translated as structure, which really brings a lot of misunderstandings. But this point is extremely important, and you can see uh, that when the extremely important point is not translated correctly, so it brings really misunderstanding of the whole theory. It brings a misunderstanding of the non-classical character of the uh, uh, approach Vygotsky proposed to the world psychology. So I think now you need a break for five minutes and after the break we will go on.